Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you for fellowshipping. We thank you for each other. And Father, I just pray again that you would minister to each and every one of us. Help us to understand your word. Father, we just open ourselves up to you and we just ask that you would inspire us and draw us near to yourself. In the name of Yeshua. Amen. So today we're going to do a, do a teaching on uh, Shemot, which is this week the name of this week's Torah portion. Is actually called Shemot, which in Hebrew is names. So we're only going to read out one verse. Today is a good example of how you can get so much out of one verse. It can lead you on to many other things. We're going to start off with Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. And it says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So Moses was tending the flock near Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai. Mount Horeb and Mount Sinai is the same mountain. So Moses was tending the flock near Mount Horeb. And the word tending here, I don't know what other translations say, but mine says tending. The word tending here is more concretely to pasture. To pasture. So he was tending the flock, he was pastoring the flock. Right? The Hebrew word for tendering or pasture is roe, roe, and this particular form of the word is a verb, and this also means one who provides and protects the flock and takes desire in them. So a, one that's pastoring or tendering the flock is one that provides and protects the flock and takes desire in them. We learn a lot from the pictograph meaning of this word. So we're just going to have a look at the pictograph. And here we have the three letters of row A. We have the Rach, which is the picture of the head. The I is the iron. And the Hay is the man with his hands in the air. Hay. And the Rach means the head of a man. The iron is an eye. And Hay means to look. Or behold, that's why the man's got his hands in the air. He's going, hey, look, wow, look at that. That's what that means. So when we combine these three meanings, it means the man who looks and watches. The man who looks and watches, which is exactly what a shepherd is. So exactly what a shepherd does over his flocks and his herd. He's one that watches and looks over the flocks and herds. A shepherd closely watches over his flock and most of the time they are his only companions. He's out there in the middle of nowhere. He's got no other company except his animals. So you can just picture him having little chats with them and he'd have his little favourites. And I was just thinking the other night when... Uh, we met somebody's dog <laughs> and people talk to their dogs. <laughs> oh, you're such a good little boy. <laughs> you can imagine a shepherd doing this with uh, different sheep, you know, being out there in the middle of nowhere for, for weeks and weeks on end. They're his only companions a lot of the time. So a shepherd, this roe is, is a shepherd and closely watches over and looks over the flock. The word shepherd shares the same root, but obviously it's in the noun form because a shepherd's a, a, a person. It's in the noun. Whereas the tendering and the pastoring is the verb. It's what the shepherd does. It's the action of the noun. 
and the basic meaning of the root, roe, means to satisfy the needs, which is exactly what a good shepherd does. Satisfies the needs, whether it's shelter, food or protection. So the, the, the basic meaning of roe is one that satisfies needs. So a good shepherd or would, would satisfy the needs of the flock in every area, protection, providing food and water, and also shelter. This word is also behind one of the words for being a teacher. And this is where they get the modern day pastor from. A pastor of a modern day church is supposed to be one that satisfies needs or looks over and watches over the, the rest of them supposed to be. Moshe was his person over the flock of his father-in-law. He was the protector. He was the one that met their needs. In verse 1 of what we just read out in Exodus, it also says that he was in the desert. He was in the desert. And this, when I learned this, it sort of shifted my perspective a little bit. In verse 1 it says that he was in the desert. This is not a very good translation, as the Hebrew word used here is midbar, which comes from the, the root deber. The original meaning of midbar is not wilderness in the sense of a desolate place. It means an area suitable for pasturage, which makes sense as one would not take a flock to feed in the desert. So sometimes we can get a picture of a desert of this being this sandy place and no grass. Why would you take your flock there? So when I thought, oh, wow, that makes sense. This wilderness or this place is more better described as a place where there was grass. So you can tender and pasture the flock where the flock can feed, where the flock can eat. The flock, then you're not going to lead, a shepherd's not going to lead a flock out in the middle of a sandy desert. So it just shows you uh, how digging a little bit deeper is uh, can just shift that mindset a little bit. He wasn't out in the middle of the desert. He was at a place where there was grass and this place was around Mount Horeb. So it's telling us and teaching us that there was grass around this place which may become significant later because that's where they all ended up. After the deliverance of Egypt, they had their flocks and their herds with them. So they were obviously taken to a place where there was pasturage. So yeah, the original meaning of Midbar is not wilderness in the sense of a desolate desert. It means an area, area suitable for pasturage, which makes sense as one would not take a flock to feed in a desert taken to a place where there was actual pasture. For example, here's an example of this word for pasture. In Micah 2.12, it says, I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. That's exactly the same word, the same root. They bear, and they shall make a loud noise because of so many people. I thought, wow, there's going to be a few of us. We're going to be in the same fold and we're going to be <laughs> noisy. We're going to be making a bit of noise because there's so many of us. So we learned back in Exodus 3.1 the principle, first in the natural and then in the spiritual. This is one of the principles that we learn when we're reading our Bibles, is first in the natural and then in the spiritual. So what do I mean by that? Moshe learned the natural principles of shepherding first. He was shepherding his father-in-law's sheep. So Yahweh took him out from Egypt and he ended up in the family of Jethro, his father-in-law, and he learnt the principles of shepherding first, first in the natural. He learnt first how to tender, how to pasture, how to feed, 
how to support. Remember we said that the word meant to satisfy the needs? He learned how to satisfy the needs of the sheep in the natural. He was watching them, he was protecting them and leading the flock. And as he was doing this, then he had the encounter with Yahweh and became the shepherd of the father's flock. Moshe was sent to gather the flock, the people of Israel, first in the natural and then in the spiritual. There is also a messianic pattern here of the good shepherd. As we know that there is ultimately one good shepherd who watches, provides and tends his father's flock. The good shepherd is gathering his flock as we speak. And hopefully we're part of that flock. In Deuteronomy 18.18 18, it says, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brethren and will put my words in his mouth and he will speak to them all that I command him. So this is telling the people of Israel that he was going to raise up a prophet from among the brethren. And we know Yeshua was his prophet. We know Yeshua was his prophet spoken of in Deuteronomy 18 because Yeshua came from the tribe of Judah from among his brethren. And both Peter and Stephen testify in the book of Acts that the prophet is Yeshua. Both Peter and, and Stephen both testify in Acts 3 and in Acts 7 that this was the prophet that was spoken of of Moses because the people of Israel were all looking and watching and waiting for the prophet who was the Messiah. So moving on to Psalms chapter 118 verses 19 to 29 and it says, Open to me the gates of righteousness, and I will go through them, and I will praise Yahweh. This is the gate of Yahweh through which the righteous shall enter. I will praise you, for you have answered me and have become my salvation. That word there, my salvation, is Yeshua. It actually says Yeshua in the Hebrew. You have become Yeshua. You have become my salvation. The stones which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is a messianic psalm. This was the Lord's doing or Yahweh's doing and is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now. Same word, the root word of Yeshua. Save now, I pray. O Yahweh, O Yahweh. I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. We have blessed you from the house of Yahweh. God is Yahweh, and he has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, I will exalt you. I give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. So there's a reason why I'm reading this psalm out and it will become clear soon. So we're going to do something a little different today. We're going to read some scriptures out together. Well, I'm going to read them and you follow on in your own Bibles. So we're turning to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34 and verse 11. Remember when we're talking about shepherds, we're talking about one who watches and looks over and one who satisfies the needs and all those things. So in your own time, you can read the first 10 verses of this chapter. I'm just not going there for time's sake, but it talks about irresponsible shepherds and wicked shepherds. But we're going to pick it up from verse 11 of chapter 34. And it's talking about Yahweh, the shepherd. And it says, For thus says Yahweh, Elohim, Indeed, I myself will search for my sheep. So as we're reading this, I just had a thought, as, I, as we're reading this, you have to think about Yeshua. 
Because what did Yeshua say? I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So when Yeshua mentions different things, they all know these verses. All the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes, they all know Ezekiel 34. So when he's talking about the lost sheep of Israel and I'm the good shepherd and I'm this and I'm that, they all know, they're all thinking of Ezekiel 34. They're all thinking of Psalms, what we just read out, because these guys know the scriptures back to front. So let's continue. For thus says Yahweh Elohim, Indeed, I myself will search out for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock on the day he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my sheep and deliver them from all the places where they were scattered on a cloudy and dark day. That sounds like a day coming in the future, the day of trumpets. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I will bring them to their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them the good pasture and their fold shall be on the high mountains of Israel. There they shall lay down, lie down in a good fold and feed in rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will make them lie down, says Yahweh Elohim. I will seek what was lost, bring back what was driven away, bind up the broken, sounds like Isaiah, and bind up the broken and strengthen what was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong and feed them in judgment. Talking about the bad rulers. And as for you, O my flock, thus says Yahweh Elohim, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. Is it too little for you to have eaten up the good pasture that you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pasture and to have drunk of the clear waters that you must foul the residue with your feet? As for my flock, they eat what you have trampled down with your feet and they drink what you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus says Yahweh Elohim to them, Behold, I myself will judge between the fat and the lean sheep, because you have pushed with side and shoulder, but at all the weak ones with horns and scattered them abroad. Therefore, I will save my flock. They shall no longer be a prey, and I will judge between sheep and sheep. In verse 23, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David, which is a direct reference to Yeshua. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, Yahweh, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, Yahweh, have spoken. I will make a covenant of peace with them and cause wild beasts to cease from the land and they will dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will call showers to come down in their seasons. There shall be showers of blessings. Then the trees of the field shall yield their fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase. They shall be safe in their land, and they shall know that I am Yahweh. When I have broken the bands of their yoke and delivered them from the hand of those who enslave them, and thou shalt no longer be a prey for the nations, nor shall beasts of the land devour them. But they shall dwell in safety, and no one shall make them afraid. I will raise up for them a garden of renown, and they shall no longer be consumed with hunger in the land, nor bear the shame of the Gentiles any more. Thus they shall know that I, I, Yahweh, am their God, and am with them, and they, the house of Israel, are my people, says Yahweh Elohim. You are my flock, the flock of my pasture. You are men, and I am your God, says Yahweh. I mean, what a powerful prophecy. Now, this has only partially come to pass because we have had that one shepherd come. He has come, and he's coming again. So this is a messianic word of who 
the shepherd is and what he will do. So obviously the fulfillment, the total fulfillment of this passage hasn't come to pass yet. It will come to pass when he returns because he will gather all the flock and they will all gather into Israel and he will be the shepherd and Yahweh will be the God. So why am I saying all this? Let's go, to, let's go over now to John chapter 10. And this is Yeshua speaking. He says, Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls to his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, so they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger or strangers. Yeshua used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Yeshua said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come to except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. So he's saying this and they all knew Ezekiel 34. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. In verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And the other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them I also I must bring and they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. And you can read the rest of that, which there's a lot in it. The Middle Eastern shepherds speak of themselves as a door. The Middle Eastern shepherds speak of themselves as a door of the sheep, since they habitually lie down across the open entry to a sheepfold, and their body forms a barrier to intruders, whether thieves or wild beasts. And here's a, a picture I found that beautifully represents that. You can see him sitting in the uh, doorway. I am the door. No one comes in except by me. And this picture also is a uh, picture of an ancient sheepfold. When they were out in the desert like Moses was in Exodus chapter 3, when the evening came, they would go around and find all these sticks and branches and make their own sheepfold. Normally normally of thorn bushes and and prickly plants to... uh, cause a barrier between wild beasts and then you can see the little entry there where the uh, shepherd would most likely rest at night to protect the sheep. So this is just a, uh, a picture of what it may have looked like back in the day. I've got a couple of stories I want to read out now and they're, they'll be on the screen to show you the, uh, the wonderful picture of a Hebrew Middle Eastern shepherd and the flock and how they relate to one another. And this is in the context of us and Yeshua as well. 
So here's the, here's the first one. On this gathering, calling and leading of the sheep, the remarks of G.A. Smith on the boundless eastern pasture, the shepherd is indispensable. With us, sheep are often left to themselves, and it's like that in Australia. Sheep are just left to themselves in the, uh, in the, in the paddocks. And he says, I do not remember to have seen in the east a flock without a shepherd. In such a landscape as Judea, where a day's pasture is thinly scattered over an unfenced tract, covered with delusive paths, still frequently with by wild beasts and rolling into the desert. The man in his character is indispensable. Sometimes we enjoyed our noonday rest besides one of those Judean wells to which three or four shepherds would come down with their flocks, the flocks mixed with each other, and we wondered how each shepherd would get his own again. But when after the watering and the playing were over, the shepherds one by one went up different sides of the valley and each called out his peculiar call and each sheep drew out of the crowd to their own shepherd. And the flocks passed as orderly as they came in. I mean, this is just an amazing story. Like, you could have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of sheep, and they could all be mingled in together, and each shepherd had their own peculiar call. And the sheep knew exactly who their shepherd was. And I think you'll like this next story. During the riots in what was called Palestine in the middle 30s, a village near Haifa was condemned to collective punishment by having its sheep and cattle sequestered, sequestrated by the government. The inhabitants, however, were permitted to redeem their possessions at a fixed price. Among them was an orphan shepherd boy whose six or eight sheep and goats were all he had in the world for life and work. Somehow he obtained the money for their redemption. He went to the big enclosure where the animals were penned, offering his money to the British sergeant in charge. The NCA told him he was welcome to requisite number of animals, to the requisite number of animals, but ridiculed the idea that he could possibly be pick out his little flock from among the confiscated hundreds. The little shepherd thought differently because he knew better and giving his own call, for he had his neigh, which is a shepherd's pipe with him, his own separated from the rest of the animals and trotted out after him. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. I thought, two beautiful pictures of uh, how Yahweh sees us and how we should see him. We need to know the voice of our shepherd when he calls. So let's go back to John 10, 5. When we as believers hear strange or foreign voices that are contrary to the ways of Yahweh, we should flee, as described in John 10, 5. In John 10, 5, I'll just read it out again. It says, Yes, they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. So we should flee when we hear the voice of strangers. For example, come let us celebrate Christmas. Come let us celebrate Easter. Come, let us celebrate New Year's. This should be a strange call to a follower of Yeshua. This is a strange shepherd calling. When people say to come and worship and do things differently to what our Bible say, that is the voice of a stranger. That is the call of a strange shepherd. or participating in other days throughout the year, and there are many, like we see many people practice, participating in practices to do with different solstices of the sun. 
all around the world, including Australia, people gather together for these events and participate. Not mixing other philosophies, religions or beliefs. Again, this is a strange shepherd and we are to flee. So when I'm talking about philosophies, I'm talking also about Judaistic philosophy because there's a lot of philosophy in Judaism. There's a lot of philosophy in Christianity. I'm talking about just sticking with the Bible and what it says. We're not to mix religions or beliefs. Again, this is a strange shepherd and we are to flee. There are many famous celebrities that peddle. There are many ways or paths to God. These are strange shepherds. These people influence hundreds of thousands and even millions of people. They are not talking about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. When someone says there are many ways to God, you can go this way or that way, that's a strange shepherd. That's a lie. And there's many out there that say these things. As Yeshua himself said, we just read it, I am the door. There is no one else. There is no other way. There is only one way to the Father. There is only one way to eternal life, and that is through Yeshua HaMashiach. It's just plain and simple as that. There is only one way, and that is through him, the Good Shepherd. I thought this picture was very fitting of responding and knowing the Shepherd. He's the only way. He's the only way of a believer. When the shepherd leads out and calls his sheep, they will hear and follow. We just read that in John 10. How does he lead and call? How does this good shepherd we call Yeshua the Messiah, how does he lead and call? Let's go through some examples. He yells out, he calls out in the Sabbath. It's the Sabbath day. We are to follow. Oh, it's Passover or any of the other feast times, he calls out and we are to follow. If we're in a restaurant and we have different options to eat, we choose clean foods, we follow. We do with our money in tithes and offerings what he asks us to do, we follow. This is how the shepherd leads and calls. The way we treat fellow sheep, we follow. So these are all different ways how the shepherd, the good shepherd, leads and calls those that know his voice. When reading and studying our scriptures, there is just nothing like getting an understanding of them from a Hebraic perspective. We can learn a lot about the attitudes and characteristics from the nature of a Middle Eastern shepherd how he or she would tend, care, protect and nourish and water their flocks. Because there were women shepherds as well, shepherdess, what are they, what? shepherdesses, <laughs> I guess. Rachel was one. Zipporah, we just read earlier, she came from all her and all her sisters were shepherdess, shepherdesses. So there was uh, women shepherds as well and they all had the same attitude they all tended cared protect nourished and watered their flocks it is interesting in ancient egypt despised and looked upon the shepherd egypt in the bible times was symbolic of the world and its ways and i believe nothing has changed there's still this despising of the people who a, want to be led by the Good Shepherd. And B, who want to have the characteristics of the Good Shepherd. I just find it amazing how we read that the uh, Egyptians despised the shepherds. They despised the Hebrew people because they were shepherds. Nothing's changed. One of the most famous Psalms in the world, Psalm 23. Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. 
he restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Sounds like he's satisfying the needs. As we read earlier at the start of the teaching. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Relating specifically to the scriptures. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. So we have a shepherd that lays at the door and those that are obedient and those that follow are in the sheepfold. And when the enemy wants to come, when the wild beast wants to come, whoever wants to come, the world wants to come with their plans or whatever, it does not matter because we have a good shepherd that will fight and has fought to the death and then resurrected again. We have a shepherd that cannot be conquered and we need to stay in that pen. He is Yahweh Ra'ai, which is Yahweh my shepherd. And those that follow him and those that are a part of his fold and have a good shepherd, as we just read out in Psalm 23, are like this. They're happy. They're in a good flock. And they've got the light shining over them. They've got the Yahweh watching over them and keeping them safe. Their, their needs are satisfied because of the good shepherd, the one who satisfies all the needs of the sheep. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We just read in our scriptures, Father, in Ezekiel 34, John 10, you are the good shepherd, Psalm 23. Father, you satisfy, you only satisfy our every need. Father, we thank you Yeshua, that you lay in the door. You are the door. And no one can come in except through you. Father, we pray that you will always be at the door of our lives. Father, I pray that each and every one of us will be in that pen and that you will be our protector, that you would lead us out and that you would bring us in. Father, I pray that we would never forget you are the good shepherd. And Father, when things get tough, we should look to you. When we're going through difficult times, we should look to you. Because you are the only one that can satisfy our need. You are the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes through to the Father except through you. And Father, I just want to thank you that we know that revelation today. I thank you that we have that understanding today. That we understand and know that Yeshua is the only way. His blood made a way for us. And I thank you that you're still sitting and standing at the door and that you let us in and you let us out. Father, I pray that we will always be a people that will only respond to your call, that we will be only be led by your ways and that we will be able to discern the strange call and when we do that we would flee from it. Father, because they come, those calls come so close to what your word says, but yet they're so far. Father, I pray that you would lead us by your spirit, that you would give us discernment to discern the calls, and that we would only follow the good shepherd. We would only follow the ways of Yahweh, that we would only do what you've called us to do. Father, help us to be those people. Lead us out and bring us in. Father, we just place all our faith and all our trust in you. You are the good shepherd. We bless you and we worship you and we glorify your name. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www dot ancient foundation bible fellowship dot com Shalom